My friends, welcome to The Word Exposed. Join me in contemplating the Lord present in the Holy Scriptures today, the 32nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. In today's Gospel, Jesus noticed the Jewish pilgrims in the temple in Jerusalem. They were praying, of course, and also handing their contributions to the treasury. It was part of the pious traditions of the Jews to go to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. Jesus brought to the attention of His disciples two personalities, the rich making a large contribution, while the poor widow giving only two coins. Did she give less than the rich? For Jesus, she gave more, because her whole existence depended on the two coins, unlike the rich who gave a large sum, but was just the surplus of what they possessed not threatening their survival. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will not invent new truth. The Holy Spirit will lead us to the truth that Jesus has already taught. When you have the Holy Spirit, you can speak and explore different languages to address people of different needs. Barriers and boundaries of discrimination, division, and injustice should disappear. The diversity of the gifts should not be a hindrance to the strengthening of the church. God chooses all. A reading from the book of Kings. In those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there. He called out to her, Please bring me a small cupful of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, Please bring along a bit of bread. She answered, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose. But first make me a little cake and bring it to me then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and he and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The Word of the Lord. Our first reading for this Sunday is taken from the first book of Kings. Let us reflect on how the poor are significant to God. The poor are special and significant for God. Maybe the world does not give importance to the poor. The poor are even considered a problem. But for God, they are the most significant of persons. In the first reading, Elijah the prophet encounters a widow at Sarephath. And it was a time of famine. Everyone was suffering. But more so, this widow, just like all the other widows in the land. A widow is not only a person, a woman, who has lost her husband. In the tradition of that time, a widow is considered one of the most vulnerable and even insignificant persons. And this widow, encountering 
Elijah said the truth. Elijah asked for food, and she said, well, we have barely enough for my son and myself. We will prepare a meal, and after eating it, we will just wait for death. But Elijah persisted, and Elijah invoked the name of God. God promised that the jar of flour and the jug of oil will never run dry. And look at how this poor widow did something which the world will consider foolish. She did as the prophet Elijah had suggested. She trusted in the word of God coming from Elijah. And through her, God produced a miracle. The prophet was able to eat. She and her son ate for a whole year. And the story ended without any mention of death. This is the poverty of the widow. Not only not having anything, but the poverty of someone who believed in providence. The poverty of someone who says, I do not rely on what I have, but I rely on the one who cares for all, and that is God. For the world, this is foolishness, but for God, this is the moment of miracle. This is the significance of the poor in God's design. It is through the poor in their faith, the faith of those who have nothing. It is in them that God's mighty works are accomplished. And look at how she, as a poor person, believed. She gave what she could not afford to give. She gave what would cause her death. But in the hands of God, she lived and she was able to give life to her son and to Elijah. It has been a while now since we started this program in 2008. From day one, you have been with us, our dear friends, assisting us with open hands. We are inviting you once again to be our partners in this ministry. Following the mandate of the Lord to bring the good news to all, we can continue to broadcast and reach more people with your support, bringing the good news to them through television and the internet. Friends, your offering would be very much appreciated. Thank you. May the Lord reward you a hundredfold. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. Not that he might offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, 
but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. The Word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the letter to the Hebrews. The theme that we have been reflecting on is the significance of the poor for God and God's design of salvation. In the first reading, the widow of Sarephath did something which the world will consider foolish. She gave up, as it were, the meager resources that she and her son had in order to feed the prophet Elijah. She believed in the word of God transmitted to her by Elijah. And in faith, she gave everything that was left for her and her son to survive. But in her and through her, the miracle of God happened. It is through the poor who believe and who give everything up to death, up to the threat and danger of death, that life really springs. And it is the same that we see in the second reading. The figure of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, presented by the letter to the Hebrews as our high priest, the mediator between God and humanity, the mediator of a new covenant. Now, the Hebrews were familiar with high priests serving the community and God in the temple. And every year, the high priest would enter the temple in order to offer to God sacrifice for the sins of the people and their own sins. And the sacrifice that they normally brought to the sanctuary was the blood of animals. And then they also burned the flesh of the animals. But when it comes to Jesus, it is not the blood of somebody else. It is not the blood of an animal. It is not the life of an animal. It is His own life given freely to God out of love and given freely out of love for sinful brothers and sisters. This is the new covenant. This is the new sacrifice. Total giving, just like the widow in the first reading, giving everything that I need to survive. And if I give everything, I will die, but I will give nonetheless. We see this exemplified in Jesus. And so his sacrifice does not need to be done by him every year. It was so complete that it is once and for all. And his total gift of self became the source of salvation for many, many erring and sinful brothers and sisters. Jesus, our high priest, was poor and became poor. He gave everything that he had, his body and blood. And through him, we have life. The Proclamation of the Holy Gospel According to Mark In the course of his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. They devour the houses of widows and, as a pretext, recite lengthy prayers they will receive a very severe condemnation. 
he sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury, for they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. The Gospel of the Lord. Our Gospel for this Sunday is taken from St. Mark. We have been developing the theme of the significance of the poor for God and God's plan of salvation. In the first reading, Elijah asked of a widow in Sarephath something which was almost cruel and humanly, worldly, uh, foolish. But the widow, believing in God's word through the prophet, acceded, accepted the offer. She cooked the meager uh, food that they had in order to feed Elijah, believing that God will not abandon them. This foolish act of faith and generosity on the part of the widow became an occasion for God to produce a miracle of life, of consolation, of fidelity. The faith of a poor person who gave everything that she had in order to survive, risking her life, throwing herself into the hands of God, this is the significance of the poor. We find this also in Jesus, in the second reading. The high priest who offered to God in the heavenly sanctuary not the blood of any other person or of an animal sacrificed to God, but offered himself, his whole life, his body, his blood. And by that total offering unto death, not leaving anything for himself, he became the source of salvation for many brothers and sisters. In the gospel, we have three types of persons who have their three brands of giving, especially giving to God and to others. The first is the scribes. And Jesus noticed that the scribes were really giving service to the temple and to the people. But what type of giving? It was giving in order to draw attention to themselves. It was a form of giving so that they could get something in return. Honor, prestige, respect. And is that giving? No. It is really rubbing in order to feed one's interest. And they have victims, especially poor widows. That's one type of giving. It is a false type of giving, which in the end is utilizing, manipulating others in order to give to myself, not to God and not to others. The second group might be well-meaning, well-intentioned, the rich, who gave vast amounts of money to the temple. But according to Jesus, that was just surplus. The surplus from their livelihood. So, yes, they're able to give a lot, but what is retained or kept is bigger. So, yes, they give, but their lives are not affected. Their lives do not become insecure, not at all threatened by their giving. Because what is given, again, maybe with good intentions, is just the extra, the excess, 
So life continues its merry way in its merry way. Nothing harmful has come. The third is a widow who put into the treasury box two copper coins. Now, compared to the big amount of money donated by the rich, the two copper coins really amounted to nothing. But Jesus sees something. And here our theme is valuable. While monetarily, quantitatively, the two copper point, coins are insignificant, for Jesus, it is the most significant. Why? Because the whole life of the widow depended on the two coins. Jesus saw not two coins being donated. Jesus saw a life being given as an offering to God because the two coins meant survival or death for the widow. So qualitatively, she has given more because she had given the symbol of her life. And by giving it, she was risking her life. She was even probably already ready to face hunger and death. But all done in faith. So like Jesus, who offered not something, but his life. We have many poor people who could not give anything, but they give what they have, what they live on. Their very lives are their very gift and sacrifice to God. And through them, God accomplishes great things. They may not draw the attention of the media and journalists. They will never be mentioned no, as heroes, but they are for God, the real significant heroes of the world and even of the church. And so I pay tribute to the many unnamed men and women, widows, the poor, the teachers who could have chosen salaries which were more lucrative, but to continue teaching in small schools, in mission schools. In fact, they give more to the education of the youth because they're not there to get, they're there to give of their lives. And sometimes what they get in return is nothing compared to their risk of life. And there are many, many more unsung people. But I want to assure you, you are significant for God. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it. It has been a while now since we started this program in 2008. From day one, you have been with us, our dear friends, assisting us with open hands. We are inviting you once again to be our partners in this ministry. Following the mandate of the Lord to bring the good news to all, we can continue to broadcast and reach more people with your support, bringing the good news to them through television and the internet. Friends, your offering would be very much appreciated. Thank you. May the Lord reward you a hundredfold. Dearest Lord, teach me to be generous 
says the prayer attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola. The prayer continues with many selfless acts, giving without counting the cost, fighting without heeding the wounds, laboring without asking for reward. Generosity as an act of faith, but also a temptation of vanity, will be our topic today. The readings this Sunday underline generosity. The poor widow gave Elijah something to eat despite her and her son's need. Jesus gave up his life for us through a shameful death, even though he could have spared himself as God's son. The poor widow at the temple gave her coins to the treasury in her own poverty. These events demonstrate for us generosity and invite us to look at generosity as an act of faith. The poor widow believed in the promise of the stranger Elijah who asked for food. Jesus believed in the Father's justice and offered himself as a sacrifice. The poor widow believed that God, whom she came to worship at the temple, would take care of her. So, genuine generosity is founded on faith. It is an act of faith because in it, we abandon ourselves to providence, foregoing all calculation. For we believe, as it is written, the jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry. The jar and jug of God's graces will never be empty. There will always be something for each of us. The generous person detaches oneself from possessions and shares them with others. But being generous can be an occasion for temptation too. Aha! Like the rich persons depicted in the Gospels, we may fall into the trap of vanity making our supposed generosity an opportunity to promote ourselves. I donated this much, so my name must be mounted somewhere in the edifice, or I must be given the special seat, or I must be acknowledged publicly, so people might know how generous I am. But what does Jesus teach us? In the Gospel of Matthew, He says, that an act of generosity must be done in secret. What our right hand has given, our left hand must not know. We must not seek the applause of the crowd, but the recognition of the Father who sees everything. Brothers and sisters, being generous is certainly an admirable thing. In fact, the term is from the Latin generosus, which means noble, magnanimous. But lest we fall into the temptation of looking at generosity as an accomplishment we call attention to, let us respond to the invitation to look at generosity as an act of faith in God, who is all generous and who desires us to refrain from showing off. Let us have a meaningful Sunday. Here are some points for your reflection. Please write them down and share them with your prayer companions. The first point is, how can we restore trust in providence in a world that worships achievements? Paano natin mapapanumbalik ang pagtitiwala sa Diyos sa isang mundong sumasamba sa sariling pagsisikap? The second point is, what factors prevent us from being generous to others? 
ano ang mga naghahadlang sa atin para maging bukas palad sa iba. O oh God, you created everything through your word. As we contemplate you in the scriptures proclaimed and heard today, renew us as your children and as brothers and sisters to one another. Amen. My friends, thank you for joining me this morning. May the Lord present in the scriptures make your heart burn for love of Him and move you to love others. Until next Sunday, only here on The Word Exposed.